my name is uh, John Lundwall. I have a doctorate in Comparative Myth and Religious Studies from Pacifica Graduate School in California, and I'm the project leader of the uh, Fremont Archaeoastronomy Project in South Central Utah. Uh, today, I'm going to be going over um, sort of the evolution of that study and showing you what at least the ancient Fremont culture did uh, with their rock art. It's actually really cool. I have this uh, intro video that I think I'm just going to skip because uh, I don't have good audio. So, we'll just can't. Can you see that? Is it dark enough? Can we just make it a little darker? So these are, yeah, okay. You know what? That's great. If the camera doesn't see me, then. Um, all right, uh, look, I'm a founding board member of the Utah Valley Astronomy Club. It's a nonprofit organization. We uh, partner with state and national parks in Utah to help run their astronomy program. So I was down in Fremont Indian State Park in May of 2017. Um, uh, Fremont Indian State Park is in south central Utah. It's about two and a half hours south from here. If you drive on I 15 until you hit I 70, go east on I-70 for 20 minutes, you run right into it. So I was down there running a star party for them. They were uh, uh, registering for dark sky status for star watching. Utah, by last count, had the most IDA, International Dark Sky Association, registrations in the country. So um, I was down there helping them get that set up, and I was down there for three days. And of course, during the night, I was doing star parties, and during the day, this is my son Jacob, and we were hiking all the canyons, looking at all the petroglyphs. And there's over a thousand petroglyphs on the bluff in Clear Creek Canyon at uh, Fisk, Fremont Indian State Park. Um, and most of them are deer and sheep and elk, and there's spirals and circles. Uh, there's uh, anthropomorphs, deities, humanoid figures. And then I walked up to this petroglyph right here, and it was something completely different. <coughs> Here's a close-up of it, and it's uh, entirely a geometric panel, and it's large. It's over six feet long, four feet high, and uh, it was really unusual. Now, <clears throat> it turns out I walked up to this uh, petroglyph at a stroke of luck, right at the right time, because something was happening on this petroglyph that really caught my eye. Can anyone see what might be interesting? We had this triangular shadow moving across it. And, uh, you know, I'm not a Fremont expert, and I was just there running a star party. But uh, I walked up, and, it, it, you know, after several more observations of this, I've been down there now dozens of times with time-lapse photography cameras, and you're going to see some of this. Um, <clears throat> turns out, had I been there an hour earlier, I wouldn't have seen that shadow. Had I been there an hour later, I wouldn't have seen that shadow. That shadow only occurs two hours a day, three months of the year. And I just happened to walk up to it right when it was doing its thing. So, um, so I looked at that and I thought, well, are they using the shadow at all to help? Is this a, a calendar device? So that shadow made me really look hard at the... Uh, the panel. And so, first thing I did is over here, this is an IR image, an infrared image. It helps bring out some of the background uh, stuff. And uh, first thing I did is I counted these wedges. There's 12 wedges. And one of these wedges has a series of lines in them. And I uh, counted the lines. There's 11 lines. Now, you wouldn't know this unless you're a backyard astronomer or just a super geek. Oh, wait, you might all know this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it turns out that in a lunar year, 12 lunar months, synodic months of 29 and a half days, 12 lunar months is 11 days short of a solar year. So I counted the 12 wedges and I counted the 11 lines and I thought, well, maybe that's just coincidence. Or, holy crap, that is a, a mnemonic device where they're reconciling their lunar and solar counts. Now, look, I've been watching this thing for 10, 15 minutes, and 
I walked, uh, you know, just with that realization, I realized this is a calendar glyph, and they probably are using the sunlight and shadow. I don't know how. These dots, there's set 37 of them. Didn't know what that meant. There's seven wavy lines. Didn't know what that meant. There's these deep pecked dots. There's one up here. Um, didn't know what that meant. All I knew is there's a really interesting shadow moving across this, and there's 12 wedges and 11 lines. That's enough to convince me that this at least is a basic calendar implement. So what do you do? Well, you think about, well, if I wanted to study this, how many hours would that take, and how many times would I have to drive down? I need time-lapse photography. Oh, this is just too much. So I uh, called an archaeologist friend of mine and said, hey, let's do this. <laughs> and so uh, John McHugh's my research partner. Uh, he's a trained archaeologist. He lives in Salt Lake. And he and I started the Fremont uh, Indian Archaeoastronomy Project. Well, now I am going to play you this video so that you can see the sounds coming out of my computer, so just be quiet, because it's not great sound. It's only 90 seconds. So when I first walked up, I thought the shadow uh, was moving across. But then as I studied it over the course of a year and a half, uh, the shadow actually recedes from the ground, and they're, and they're not actually watching the shadow. They're watching this triangle of light. And it moves up from the ground, and it, the tip of that triangle of light first touches this dot, and then moves and it touches that dot, and then it moves and ends, and do you see that dot up there in green? That touches that dot. And, and then the shadow phenomenon disappears. So it, one, is very clear that these dots were carved based off that light coming up from the ground during the three months of the summer, of the summer during the two hours that this phenomenon happens. The entire glyph is then formatted around those dots. Now, what are they doing? Well, the first thing is these dots are really interesting. Um, I should put a graphic without the overlaying graphic, but this hole right here is a very deep pet. They used a rock, and they pounded out a deep depression in the center of this wheel motif. I call this the sun wheel petroglyph. Same here. These are deep depressions that are pounded out with a rock. This hole up here, however, is completely different. It is perfectly circular and drilled. They used a stick and they drilled into the rock and there's striations in it. So it's not a, a peck depression, deep depression like these. It's a drilled hole. It's not natural. It is, it's definitely intentionally drilled into the rock. Now why would they do that? Well, what's that? 
It's the important one. I, I, uh, here, here's my best guess. Is there any seats? Yeah, there's a few empty seats. You can come up and sit up here. Um, my best guess is they put a stick in it. And the shadow that they're actually measuring across the petroglyph is the shadow from this gnomon stick that will move across it through the whole year. Right? The, the shadow sunlight phenomenon occurs only during the summer months because the sun actually has to be right over the rock in order for that to happen. But as the sun moves south through the year, this is summer solstice. So if the sun is at the northernmost position. As it uh, starts drifting south, this, sh this whole thing starts disappearing. It doesn't happen at all. Except if you put a shadow stick in that hole. And then you could watch how the length of that shadow move and how it moves across it. So how does that work? Well, um, I've applied to put permanent time-lapse uh, cameras at a couple spots in this park. I need six months of data from solstice to solstice. That'll give me actually 12 months of data. And, uh, and then, and then I'll, I'll have all my data. Unfortunately, getting a uh, time-lapse camera on sacred ground of an Indian site, heritage site, uh, that's not an easy thing to do. There are much easier things to do. Death is easier. <laughs> so I'm still in the process of getting permits. Uh, however, I can say it's looking good. So hopefully by summer solstice of this year, I'll have full-time time-lapse cameras running. All right, well, uh, that's the, that petroglyph is right here, the Sunwell petroglyph. And there's actually a petroglyphs on this. This is the last of the petroglyphs along the bluff, and there's a bunch of petroglyphs over here. Now, I'm looking at the uh, Sunwell petroglyph during the day, during the summer months. Uh, of course, I want to come and look at it during the night. I didn't mean to click back. Well, I was there with uh, John... McHugh, my research partner, and uh, this is the evening of spring equinox, which is here next month, right? So after the sun sets and the sky gets dark, one of the really interesting things is, uh, do you see this constellation here? What is that? That's the Big Dipper. See that? It's, uh, the uh, wall is not great, the image is not great, but uh, there's the Big Dipper. And as you stand in front of... Uh, so first off, this picture is taken about oh, a good 50 yards away from the, the petroglyph panel. And the Big Dipper stands vertically over the rock outcrop it, uh, on the evening of summer solstice. Um, as you walk up and stand in front of the uh, pe uh, petroglyph, you can't see the tail. You see the four stars of the bull sitting right on top of the rock. That's your perspective as you're standing right in front of a petroglyph. Well, if you know anything, does anyone know anything about astronomy? You, where's the North Star in this picture? So if you go to the last two stars of the Big Dipper and you follow it, you, you hit that star and that's the North Star, right? And it turns out if you're standing right here, do you see this little, this little notch? You're standing right here. That star sits right on in that notch, wow. and that is the star that does not move. All these other stars are moving around that star, but that star is permanent. Now that's just a really interesting alignment. And once you know that, you can stand here in front of that petroglyph and take your bearings off the set star, the north star, um, and so. I was telling my research partner, the first night we were doing observations there, I said, look, first off, you can use the uh, Big Dipper as a calendar implement. Uh, because just conveniently, on the night of spring equinox, that Big Dipper is vertical over the rock, over the petroglyph. Well, at summer solstice, the Big Dipper is going to be high up in the sky overhead. At fall equinox, it's going to be sitting on the bluff to our left, and at winter solstice, it's going to be below the horizon. Uh, and so we walked up and said, well, you know, they're probably not using the Big Dipper. They're just using the four stars of the bowl because that's what you see as you're standing right here. And so you just watch where that bowl is through the year. And that also, you combine that with your shadow observations, 
and now you're, you're, you're getting a reliable calendar. Uh, so I was explaining all that, and he thought, well, that's interesting. And I looked down, and right at the upper left of this Sunwheel petroglyph is this marking. And I don't know if you can see that, but here are three squares, and this square has this long bent tail. And I said, by the way, everything I just explained uh, is, is de depicted right here. <laughs> here. Here is the, uh, the um, uh, square we're looking at at Spring Equinox. Uh, there's the square of the Big Dipper on our leftern horizon at night. Uh, and it's disappeared during the winter solstice. And um, so that's equinox, equinox, summer solstice, winter solstice. So that disappeared during the fall equinox. So <clears throat> that is carved right there. Now, is it uh, rep, you know is it showing um, you know average positions of the Big Dipper Bowl through the season? I don't know. It just is a. a there you see the uh, North Star in that dip. Um, but while we're at it, so here's the Sunwell petroglyph that we've been looking at. Over here are a bunch of petroglyphs and. Uh, this right here is a six-pointed star. Do you see that? It's the only star. That is a star petroglyph. Uh, you can find them, a couple others in this canyon, but you find them elsewhere in Utah. So it's, it's a star petroglyph. There's only one star petroglyph here, and it just so happens that if you stand in front of that star petroglyph, it's pointing north, and if you just stand in front of it and look up, the north star is right in the notch above it. So, uh, again, you wouldn't know that unless you're standing in front of it, looking up and seeing the North Star. Um, so, after you know that, after about a year of observations, I thought, you know, we are uh, we've got some good preliminary data. I'm going to get permits to do uh, time lapse photography, and uh, then something else happened. There's this uh, pretty difficult trail. I'm a big guy, and some of these trails are not. Uh, but there's a pretty difficult trail, rim trail, and we were hiking it looking for a particular uh, petroglyph in an archaeological report. And we turned the corner again at the luckiest moment of the day because what we saw was this shadow. And, and as we watched the shadow, it turns out this shadow moves across this rock face. It takes about 30 minutes for that to happen. So had we been there just a few minutes earlier, a few minutes later, we would have missed it, right? But we just happened to walk and, and discover it right when it was doing its thing. And what is it doing? Well, it, it wasn't easy hiking up cameras and tripods to this spot because it's on this slope that uh, it's just... It's, So there's the shadow that moves, and again, that's occurring only during the summer months. Uh, the shadow moves across this face, it takes about an hour from top to bottom, it moves across this face in another hour, but the time it takes to move across those petroglyphs is about 30, 40 minutes. Now here's a close-up, and you can see as the shadow touches the edge of this spiral, it bisects right through the center of the spiral on the back of that sheet touches the ed edge of this circle, goes to the center, goes right between these two sheep, I, I, I have a better image of it, and bisects that circle. In other words, so here's a close-up. There's actually an anthropomorph. Do you see that figure there? It's a triangular body, and there's two lines, those are feathers, on a feather headdress. And the shadow, when it hits the edge of the spiral, goes right between those two feathers. And it goes up, do you see this spiral? It goes right through the center of this spiral, and it continues, goes up and touches the edge of a, a, another circle up top, right? And then there's another shot where the, the shadow's through the center of this spiral. It goes right between these two sheep. See that? They've carved the head of the sheep here, the tail of the sheep there, and it bisects this circle right there. So we watched that happen, and suddenly, what are they doing? Well, 
I began to form a theory. My, here's the Sunwell Petroglyph again, the first one we looked at. And, the, and uh, I, actually, I, I went to the library and went through a ton of reading on archaeological reports, seeing what people had said about uh, the use of sunlight and shadow. And there are a few comments about, yes, they use certain alignments for the solstices and equinoxes. Uh, but something else is happening here. Uh, and I didn't find anybody writing on any of it. So, um, to test my theory, I went back to the... Uh, uh, I went back to this North Star glyph, not the uh, Sun Sun glyph. Right below it is this panel. It's about two feet in diameter, so it's not super large. But it's it's small, and I sat there for a couple of hours with my camera. The image isn't great, but here's a shaft of light that moves across it. See that? I've got some green lines in there. There are two horizontal lines that they've carved below the hands of the deity figure, and it turns out when the sunlight hits the edge of this line, it hits the edge of his head. When So there's a shot of that. When the sunlight hits the other end of, the, of this line, it goes through the center of his head. Meanwhile, another piece of sunlight moves up and touches his hand at that moment. And when the sunlight hits the edge of his head, it starts hitting the first counting dots below. <laughs> So, here's what they're doing. They're looking at the rock. They're seeing the sunlight and shadow move on the rock. And they are carving their petroglyphs in line with the sunlight and shadow lines on the rock. The sunlight is the template by which they, they create their forms. Right? These are not doodles. They're, you know, they're just splayed over the rock, and you think, well, they just randomly went up there and carved them. They didn't do that. They watched the sunlight and shadow on the rock, and then they made their marks and carved the images as that, based off how the sunlight and shadow moves across the rock. Why would they do that? Here's another example. I only have a couple pictures of it, and you can't even see it, but there's petroglyphs here. But, but what's interesting about this, by the way, is everything I've shown you so far is happening during the summer months. This panel here, the alignment happens during the winter months. Ah, oh, now, now what? Now what's? Now what can you do? Right. Now you can say, hey, huh. I could start cataloging the petroglyphs. And the ones that line up during the winter are probably, therefore, petroglyphs used during the winter. Therefore, they're associated with the winter. Uh, and the winter in the oral cultures is associated with rebirth, new life. That's when the winter solstice sun comes out of its winter position. Whereas the ones associated with the summer are associated with the summer, with the agricultural season, the growing season associated with the equinox, fall equinox harvest, right? You can start actually making a catalog of the petroglyphs based off how they're uh, aligned up with the sunlight shadow through the year. And that at least gives you a baseline for basic interpretation. Now, what's the problem with that? It is hot in here. Good grief. Um, the problem with that is that will take thousands of hours. <laughs> that will take thousands of hours of, of observation just to do one canyon. I'm just in one canyon. I, I, you know, the Fremont lived through the entire Wasatch Range, all of Utah, along the mountains mostly. And, uh, you know, there's actually Fremont settlements out in the western desert by the Utah and Nevada border. Um, you know, there are 500. A.D. C.E. to about 1300 A.D. C.E. So they lived in Utah for a good thousand years. Um, <clears throat> and so, is this methodology employed elsewhere outside of the canyon? Well, I've been all over the state of Utah. I've seen thousands of these petroglyphs. But I didn't really discover this. Uh, uh, so I kept all my work just in, in Fremont Indian State Park. So one, it would take thousands of hours just to catalog these petroglyphs in the park, and it would uh, take, well, thousands of days to do it 
all over the state of Utah to see if every tribe uh, of the Fremont were using this methodology. This is the largest Fremont settlement, by the way, yet discovered in Fremont Indian State Park. And all the Fremont uh, settlements that are discovered are almost always discovered by sheer accident. They were building I-70. Uh, they, they had this big hill um, that was uh, scheduled to be demolished, and they were going to use the dirt of the hill for road base for I-70. And the, the bulldozers came in, and they started to dismantle the hill, and they ran into the largest Fremont settlement yet discovered, right? This was 1984. So what did they do? Did they stop? No. <laughs> they stopped for 30 days. <laughs> they brought in archaeologists from BYU and uh, U of U. They came down. They had a few weeks to record the site, gather what archaeological data they had, and then they bulldozed <laughs> the hill. And so the entire settlement is now underneath I-70. <laughs> okay. The rules have changed. They would no longer do that. But 1984, that's what they did. The upside to it is there was such a hullabaloo over it that they created a heritage site there, a museum and a state park. And now they have full-time staff preserving everything that's left. And it turns out it does need preserved because there's so much graffiti on these rocks. Um, <clears throat> which, by the way, you know, there's every time I see a spiral in Utah, it has three or four bullet holes on it, right? There's some slack-jawed yokel goes around and, and, and shoots these things. I mean, I have been out in the middle of nowhere in Vernal, I mean, literally, 50 miles away from water, and I, you know, I come across a spiral, and it's got bullet holes, and I go, what? who are these people? <laughs> so, however, uh, the interesting thing uh, about the graffiti on these, it does give me a point of reference. Um, you could say, well, maybe you're just, you know, you're just seeing these alignments in the petroglyphs as, as the shadow moves across them. Well, half these panels have modern graffiti on them. So I can watch the shadow sunlight move and see it hit key points of the petroglyphs, and it's not hitting any of the key points of the graffiti. <laughs> right? So... That is actually, for me, the determining factor. This is a methodology they are using. Because the people who uh, inscribed the graffiti were clueless that that's what they were doing, and therefore it is just randomly doing it from the rock. All right, so what we know then is in several examples uh, in FIS, Fremont Indian State Park, the petroglyphs have been positioned on the rock based off the sun shadow line cast upon it. While the rock is the canvas, the sunlight is the template that determines placement and form. Uh, the sun shadow lines move, appear, and disappear through the year. This means that in at least a few cases, petroglyph panels will correspond to the season in which they were aligned. Right, look, let's say this dot right here is a person. And this line right here is the horizon, right? Uh, the sun at winter solstice will rise far to the south, but it moves across the horizon every day until it reaches the summer solstice far to the north. So the sun goes back and forth on the horizon through the year, right? In, in its extreme points, that's the solstices, right in the middle is sunrise of equinox, right? So as the sun moves across the horizon, the angles of the shadows change, right? which means that you can now watch how the sunlight and shadows were used to, to inscribe the petroglyphs on the rock corresponding to the season uh, in which, uh, depending on where the sun rises and sets. But then the question becomes, you know, why, why do this at all? Um, <clears throat> You know, there are several uh, records of uh, Native Americans saying that the rock art was living images, right? That they just didn't believe that they were art, that uh, the deity carved on that rock was a living image watching, looking, feeling over the tribe. Now, we don't think that way, right? Oral thing, these people are oral cultures. Oral cultures use analogical thinking, literate cultures use analytical thinking. Analogical thinking is if, if two things are related, they, they must be associated. 
uh, if A, um, A, the sun rises at a certain spot, B, it casts a certain shadow on the rock, C, I carve a glyph lined up with that shadow in sunlight, suddenly C is equal to A rising on that spot. Okay? And if that spot is the winter solstice, that figure then becomes the living image of rebirth. And if that sun arises at summer solstice, that figure becomes the living image of the power of summer and of growth. Right? So, literally, using this methodology, they are turning rock art into a form of sacred scripture. This is their living, religious, cosmological writing. Right? It's, it's how they imbue life into, into these art forms, which in turn imbues life into the tribe, because those art forms are actually uh, very often ritualized. But the deities we see on the rock, they'll dress up as and perform a ritual on the specific day of the year that they're tracking. And analogically, they're imbuing the tribe through that ritual, through the sun, through that figure on the rock, with the powers of the cosmos. So the petroglyphs then become a sacred hieroglyph that, because it's analogized with the sun, uh, is a living image. Any questions? Yes? About how old are these things? About what? How old are they? Uh, the uh, petroglyphs, uh, okay, so that's a really interesting question. The Fremont petroglyphs date you know, the earliest is probably 380, 300 CE. Uh, but there are petroglyphs in Utah that go back a lot earlier than that. In fact, there's a couple petroglyphs in Saratoga Springs that are probably 3500 BC. Um, now, in this canyon, I don't have a picture of it. What time do we have? I only have a few minutes. Um, Actually, the most interesting spot in this canyon, we're not going to go over today because it's its own hour presentation, but it's this little cave. It's about 30 feet wide, 6 feet deep, 6 feet tall, right? So it's a little rock shelter. And archaeologists walked into that cave and they dug 6 feet down into the ground uh, just looking for archaeological data. And they found several layers of uh, ash. So this was hearth ash, campfire ash. And that campfire ash goes back to 3500 BCE. So people had been traveling through this canyon for thousands of years, and they were using that little rock shelter cave as a rock shelter cave, right? They would get in there and build their campfire. And, and what's interesting about that cave, though, is that when the Fremont inhabited the canyon, they stopped building fires in it. And they covered the ceiling of the cave with petroglyphs. So now the Fremont are using it for something else other than a rock shelter. Which is interesting because the archaeologists call the cave the sheep shelter. They're, they're just, because they're sheep petroglyphs, they think, well, so the Fremont, this is the sheep shelter of, of the Fremont. Well, they're not using it as a shelter at all. And uh, I've done some uh, really interesting work in that cave uh, that is actually spectacular. So, um, you know. Maybe if I'm alive next year and they have me back, I'll give a presentation on, on the cave. Um, all right. Um, any other questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned that there's just a long stretch of these. Um, has there been any, like, a half-split method where you find a furthest one on each end and then you find one in the middle, study those and see how they vary along the distance? Well, um, I've just begun doing that, and that's my next slide. <laughs> um, here's another panel. I call it the walking man petroglyph because, do you see this guy? Yeah. He's really hard to make out. And in fact, the first dozen times I looked at this panel, I didn't see him. He's so faded that if the sunlight's hitting directly on the rock, you don't see it. Right? You have to be there either at dawn or dusk and that guy pops out. And then you go, oh my gosh, there's a guy there. And he's wearing a skirt, and he's holding an implement in his hand as he walks on the dots. That's not a deity figure. That's a Fremont Indian. And he's in ritual ceremonial garb, and he's doing something on those dots. 
Well, the top line of those dots, number 37. And I thought, well, that's the same as the sun mode petroglyph, 37 dots. And actually, it has the same seven wavy lines, and there's these deep pecked dots in this rock. There's a corn tassel here, and there's a corn tassel on the other one. And these two petroglyph panels are very similar. What's interesting about the walking man uh, uh, petroglyph, he, that's right here. It's on this big boulder right behind the museum, and this boulder's facing southeast. In the entire canyon, there's only two spots where petroglyphs are facing north. There's a couple petroglyphs. They're right here. It's a circle and a wavy line and another wavy line facing northwest. Now, when 99.9% .9 of your petroglyphs are facing south towards the sun, and you find one facing north, well, that's just such an oddity that you stop and say, well, what, what are they doing with that? Well, um... Here's the same rock with the Milky Way rising behind it. This is where the sun rises on summer solstice, right here at the edge of this picture. This is where the, those north-facing petroglyphs are. My theory was the only time in the year that those, these petroglyphs will get lit up by sunlight is during the summer solstice. Because that's the only time that the sun is far enough north in order to light that rock. And... Um, now, so to test this, we put up a time-lapse photography camera on summer solstice, just this past summer solstice. Unfortunately, I was in Ireland uh, looking at uh, megalithic rock art um, on the summer solstice, doing the same thing just around the world. So my research partner was there, and of course I was calling him every five minutes because I was like, what did you see? What did you see? <laughs> right? Is my theory right? And, and he said, no, it's not. I stood here all day. And when that sun rises, this, that panel is just hooked to the northwest just enough that the sunlight doesn't catch it. And I thought, oh, well, I guess that doesn't, doesn't line up with my theory. And so he, he was there until about 11 a.m. And I said, well, just keep the camera running and go do your thing. And I was very disappointed. Then I got back and I got the camera film. And at 3 p.m., the sunlight hits this space. And the first thing that gets lit up are these petroglyphs. So it's not a morning dawn event. It, it, it's a afternoon event where those petroglyphs get lit up on the north side. So what that means is this would happen for about a month, right? So a couple weeks before solstice and after. Uh, so, a Fremont Indian, the sun priest, all these tribes had a calendar priest, the sun priest, sometimes multiple sun priests. And they would have specific spots where they would watch the sun. The cave that I talked about is one of those spots. It's not a sheep shelter, it's a sheep observatory. Um, uh, but they would watch and wait till those uh, glyphs got lit up, and that would tell them that they are in the season of the summer solstice. Now, with these oral cultures, their primary calendar is actually lunar, not solar. Five minutes? All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be wrapping up. Um, so what happens is when, when all these sun shadow alignments start occurring on all the petroglyphs I've showed you, that tells them, okay, we're entering the summer month. We're coming up to summer solstice. We're now going to perform our summer solstice rituals, but they base it off the lunar phases. So they correspond their lunar and solar counts. So when these shadows and light uh, events start happening, they go to their moon and say, okay, now's the time to perform this ritual. And that's how they reconcile the lunar and solar count. They work up to the summer solstice uh, using the lunar moth. Um, all right, so just to answer your, your question, here are the two panels. This is the sun wheel, the walking man, and you can see here is actually a man on the sun wheel petroglyph that you can't see. He's got this big erect phallus because, you know, the Fremont were into that thing. That's a fertility symbol. And he's walking on the 37 dots just as this man's walking on the 37 dots. Each has a corn tassel, a quadrated uh, square. And so these panels are related. And it turns out they're the panels at the end of this bluff. So, um, and then there are petroglyphs in between. So it makes you think that there is a ritual cycle that's occurring between the two. 
right? This bears further this bears further study. That was a very excellent observation. I'm out of time, guys. Um, <clears throat> My website was supposed to be up. All my research is going to be posted on johnlundwell.com. It'll be up by next week. You can follow my work. Ultimately, I'm raising funds to do a full-length documentary on this work. Um, so come, check it out, ask any questions. You can contact me through the website.